Yep. Ready? I encourage you. First Corinthians. And tonight we'll continue our series of studies on, uh, on prayer assumptions uh, that we sometimes, we sometimes take about to be careful. Uh, the book of First Corinthians, the church at Corinth, uh, it is no doubt with great problems. Uh, there's the problem in one through three, or, or, uh, one through four, about them being their favorite preacher. I am of Paulus, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. Uh, more stock in human being the Word of God. Uh, there's a problem with the uh, from the fornicator among them in chapter 5, and uh, so they need to deal on in fornication. Chapter 6, going to law against one another. Not only are they going to law in the first half of the text, in the second half he's got to address again the problem of immorality for, and fornication. And some questions of God. Chapter 7 deals with some questions. In chapter 7, they had a lot of questions they wanted to know about marriage and were asking, uh, and some, some misconceptions, it seems, about marriage that Paul had to address. In chapter 8, in chapter 10, there's a problem of idols, and really, specifically, that's the specific but the problem is the abuse of liberty. And so in chapter 8, the Apostle Paul has to talk about uh, the meets offered idols. And verse 13, stumble. And so because they could do something, they would do it. Because I have the right to eat this meat from the marketplace. That's the specific problem. Hang it in the marketplace. Uh, it may be offered to idols, but I don't know. Paul says, buying it in the marketplace and eating is one thing. Now, obviously, don't go to the idols and, and, and eat it. He points out in chapter 10. But if you buy in the marketplace, you have the right that you can eat that if you know that it, if you don't know whether it was offered to idols or not. Uh, if you know it was offered to idols, there's a little bit different story. But if you go and just buy in the marketplace, that may or may not have been. You don't know. Uh, but you have the right to eat that. Some felt that they couldn't eat that. Paul says if they can't, don't feel they can eat it, they don't eat it. The problem was one side pushing their, uh, their use of liberties on the other. I was thinking you could eat, pushing that on those that thought you couldn't, and vice versa. And so Paul had to tell them that if they talk specifically, that you your causing your brother to stop. Chapter 9, Paul says, therefore I... Paul in chapter 9, as he often does, addresses the problem with the question What makes you who would give up your liberties? And Paul points out in chapter 9 how he's given up liberty for the sake of service to Christ and for the sake of others. He's become all things to all men. Well, then he comes in chapter 10. He says, For I do not want you to. And he talks about the example of Israel. Chapter 10. He loves all. And he tells them in verses 1 about the example of Israel. And he points out to them that the people of Israel were greatly blessed by God. And yet, in spite of this, God was not pleased with most of them. In spite of the fact that the people of Israel were greatly blessed by God, God was not pleased with most of them. We'll see more about that in a moment. And he makes application. Of Israel's example to them. Here's the application of the church at Corinth, the application that you need to take and apply in our lives as well. In the 14th through the end of the text, he talks, uh, he goes back to conclude his thoughts on eating meat offered to idols. But I want to focus on the passage that Danny read for us in 1 through 13, talk about some warning. 
some encouragement about temptation. There are two things that we can look at in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 this morning. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, there's some warnings that are given about sin and temptation that we need to be aware of. And you say, that, that, that doesn't sound, uh, you hear the warnings, but there's some encouragement that can be offered as well that can sort of uplift us when it comes to some things we need to realize about sin and temptation. So let's talk this morning about some warnings and some encouragement about sin and temptation from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Let's begin with the warnings about sin and temptation. I really want to make to our lesson this morning. Uh, we're going to talk about three warnings and then the four encouragements uh, that we can take from the text. Let's begin with warnings this morning. Warning number one what happened to you. That's the main point I'm having at early in the text. Uh, the word therefore or for, depending on your translation, in verse 1 is back, or verse 1 of the word therefore is back to the early part of the chapter. And so if you get to the early part of the chapter, uh, you see him talk about of Israel. It's a 12 and 13. Sort of a key verse. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. We already said take heed lest you fall the theme of the chapter. Our for this text in 12 is tied back it's not a standalone thought, it's tied back to Israel and the problems Israel had. Not only is it tied to the earlier part of the chapter, it's tied all the way back to what takes place in chapter 27. Look at chapter 27. In my body and control. Let's have by myself should be disqualified. And Paul points out the fact in the example of Israel that Israel is somebody that, if you will, as he using Paul's terminology, became disqualified. And so because of that, verse 12 and 13, you need to therefore take heed. The thoughts here in verse 12 and 13 are tied back to the earlier part of the chapter and even back to the thoughts at the end of chapter 9 about not, not becoming disqualified. And so don't do that by doing what Israel did as they became disqualified. So what do we learn about Israel's example, though? As we go through the text, we say, okay, 12 and 13, but what exactly do we see about Israel in the text in 1 Corinthians chapter 10? Israel was abundantly blessed by God. Israel was abundantly blessed by God. The text seems to be part of one through four, paralleling their blessings with our blessings. Uh, he doesn't specifically all up in detail, but he mentions blessings, blessings that could parallel and do parallel the blessings that we receive from God. For example, Moses baptized into the shade. And so uh, they're baptized in the Moses. Uh, uh, and, and the point being baptized into Moses, uh, we've talked about this some before, is the fact that Moses was their leader and they were to follow Moses just as we are baptized into Christ and must follow Christ. And so what Paul is doing using the term baptized into Moses and into the cloud. And that they had the blessing of having the Christ. And so he parallels those two blessings. Food and all drugs for the spirit So the same spirit the same spirit. Drink the same spiritual drink. Now, there are two possible parallels. There are two thoughts about how that can parallel lies. One is it's a reference to the Lord's Supper, and uh, that we partake of the opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper. The other is that it's the bread and drink of God's Word. Either Christians partake of the same food and drink, and that's 
talk about in verse 159. I think one where it, it, both are true. As Christians, we have a take towards suffer. We are all those who are taking the food and the drink or the bread and the drink of God's word. But the point, whether it's towards suffer or the bread and drink, is the same spirit and spirit drink. You can't get the spirit and spirit drink. There's a parallel that is real. And they the rock was Christ. The rock that was Christ. Well, in Matthew 28, in Matthew chapter 20, that he would be with us always. I want you to understand this. The things are paralleled in Israel and all. They were baptized into Moses, the cloud, and the sea. We've been baptized into Christ. They partake of the same spiritual food, spiritual drink. We partake of the same spiritual drink. They drink. Christ is promised to be with us. The point is that God blessed them greatly. Yet, despite the fact that God blessed them greatly, he was not well pleased with most of them. Look at verse 5. With most of them, they were overthrown. So he begins pointing out, beginning at verse uh, 6, some problems they had uh, concerning what made God not pleased with them. But the point in the text is God does not make them immune from temptation and did not make them immune from displeasing the Lord. And yet they still want to play from God and displease God. So we need to understand that does not mean they are immune from temptation and immune from displeasing the Lord. We'll talk about that in a second on the text itself. I was not pleased with most of them. Now these things took place that might not desire people as they did. First Corinthians chapter ten and verse uh, six. Uh, have a reference Bible. Your Bible has reference in the corner. Verse thirty-three. And the rest that was among them had a strong craving, and the people also. And they were loved with the lust they had. I mean, the desires they were having. To uh, their desire and lust for me, over the fact that God was providing and taking care of it. The people sat down to eat and drink. Exodus 32 6. That's that calf that was up on the mountain. And the people were that was there instead of serving God. Uh, verse 8, some were guilty of sexual immorality. Sexual immorality some in a single day. There's uh, a reference to chapter 25, uh, and the event unfolded in Baal. Uh, if you remember, called by Balak to curse the people, people God would not allow it. The people. And so they sent the women out among them, and the men were guilty of sexual immorality. 25,000 on a single day. Numbers chapter 25. Verse 9. And says, uh, we must not put Christ to the test or tempt Christ, as some of them did and were serpents. Uh, that's a reference to uh, Numbers chapter 21, where the people uh, were, uh, were destroyed by the serpent serpents, and that serpent, the bronze serpent, was erected for them to look at in order to be saved. And then verse 10, more grumble as some of them did, and complain. Take your pick. There's about a hundred different passages that reference to. Is that pretty much all the people of Israel did was grumble and complain? God. Uh, 
So from the time they leave early in the book of Exodus uh, to the time that they are ultimate till uh, the time they ultimately destroy uh, that generation at the end of our on through uh, people are doing nothing but grumbling and complaining against God. And so it's because of these things that God is not pleased with them. But we can just it this way. God was not pleased with them because they engaged that was simply the sins that they were guilty of, but they were guilty of sin because God was not pleased with them. I want to that though. What we learned from Israel is they were great blessed by God, yet God was five to ten. But they were written down for our destruction from whom the ages come. Here's a lesson we need to learn from this example. And it can happen to me. We could ignore our your blessings and advantages turn away from God. We can ignore the blessings and advantages that have Christian and turn away from God. It is possible for one to become so short sighted, even the blindness. Peter chapter 1. And the book of 2 Peter chapter 1 is what we refer to as the Christian grace. And in 2 Peter 1, after telling them that their faith, virtue, uh, virtue, knowledge, knowledge, self-control, self-control, steadfastness, 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 and are in they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful. For who has qualities is so that he is blind, that he was cleansed from his former sin. We don't under like those here who lack sighted. You know, I I lack because I'm sighted. I tell you everything. Uh, if I look over the edge, it's clear. I get away without. Uh, up until this last year, I was able to legally glasses because my eyes were good enough for the eye test. Well, the point is not that they're near. The problem is of us, we become It'd be that I could see my Bible sitting open here, uh, you know, and when we do that, from our former sins. And they complain time and time again. Even a blindness. Forgot that God had not. We look at the story. Terrible that the people would reject God. Take been blessed far beyond that. We were taken to the land of Egypt from an oppression of a nation, but from being captive to sin. And we've been set free by the blood of Christ to do His will. And we don't need to become so nearsighted and blind. Of our sins. We don't need to become the and in verse one. Because we forget we were cleansed from our former sins, we go back to a life of sin. We crucify begin to repent it. Of God to their own to contempt. Warning, don't you don't ignore the blessings of God and do things that do not please We like sin. Even by God, this is to be uh, be careful the example of Israel. Key. 
narrative, let him who thinks he stands, is not merely a person to understand something. We can. When we look at God and, we, and we're honest with ourselves, we have with ourselves. Now we have to be honest with ourselves. If we're honest with ourselves, we can know that we are saved. We can know that we're doing what's right in the sight of God. That's not what this verse is saying when it says, let him who thinks he stand. It's not saying, let those who think they're Christians be careful. The point is, be careful what you think, not right before God, but that you cannot fall from how you're currently standing. That's not don't think don't think you're faithful. Don't think you're faithful to the point that nothing from God. Classic example of one who was overconfident. Look at chapter 15. When in Mark chapter 14, we're reading Mark the thing in chapter 14 in the 29th verse, where Peter said to him, Even though they all fall, I will come. Look at what he said. Take me lest you fall. Peter said, if all the others fall away, not, not the Lord. He even says that he would go with Christ and be crucified as well. That is overconfidence. That is not taking he must fall. That's the one that thinks he cannot fall. And when we become overconfident, as Peter was, we are not watching as we should. First Peter chapter five and in verse eight, be sober, be vigilant. The ESV says, sober, watchful. Your adversary, the devil, walks about as a roaring lion, devour. Watchful. But if we're becoming overcome, we're not going to watch. Matthew twenty six. Uh, by the Lord. Uh, it's the end of that text where God, or, uh, it's the end of that text where the Lord three times. And Matthew 26 and in verse 41 is after Peter already saying, not me, Lord, not me, Lord, if all the others do. And Jesus the apostles with him. He tells them, watch your day lest you enter into temptation. For the spirit is will, but the flesh is weak. And we find them sleeping. And they became overcome. The others were scattered. Peter to the Lord. Because they became overconfident and it eliminated their watchfulness. And they weren't watching and praying as they should. Instead, they could not fall. So they uh, did not watch. Don't think you cannot fall. Because we become overconfident in our ability to think that we can't fall. Then we eliminate watchfulness. And then we're not being sober and vigilant or sober and watchful. And our advocate that part of the will pounce on us and take us away. What are some warnings about you do not don't let Israel happen to you? It's inevitable. Amen. Man is how it translation. Except such as is common. So the point is that the struggles that we face are not going to be more than that in a second. Any passage that affirms the universality of sin must also and also affirms the universality of of temptation. Look at James chapter 1. Think about how sin is brought forth. James chapter 1. This uh, genealogy of sin is I will begin in verse 7. the context. Blessed is the man who remains fat for trial. For he is the best. 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 He
those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God can't. But each person is tempted when he is learned and enticed by his own desire. Then desire when it is conceived of his birth. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. How do we get to sin? Well, sin results from desire. That's what he's talking about. Temptation is when we're by our own desire. And that's what we're to do. But we know sin for all that. It results from temptation. Sin is universal. Temptation is universal. It's just man. Only that. Verse 7, uh, some of uh, your translation, uh, you know, in, in Matthew 18, uh, we'll talk about offenses coming, but the ESV renders for it is necessary what? by whom temptation is uh, The ESV renders that temptation. The point is, temptation is inevitable. But necessary that temptations come. We're all going to be tempted. That's why we have to be watchful and not be overconfident. Uh, so we don't reject the blessing of God. About sin. Don't let what happens draw happen to you. Don't become overconfident and temptation. It's inevitable. We sit there and we look at that and talk about sin, and that's that. Be careful of and, and it's not all warning. There's some encouraging things that we can learn about sin and temptation. Temptation, not sin, but encouraging from the text. Go back to First chapter ten. Four, and the lesson will be yours. Number one. You are not alone in your battle. We already said But we need to understand that we're not alone. We feel like nobody knows what we're going through. You said somebody say it. Somebody says, hey, you know, we try to encourage somebody and they say, nobody understands what I'm facing. Nobody knows what I'm going through. Well, the text says that it, when it says it doesn't just mean that temptation is going to come. There's nothing you can face that somebody else hasn't faced. They are common. I want you to this First John chapter 2. Text. Ways. First John chapter two. Now there are several different things that may fall under this category, but in First Corinthians, or First John rather, chapter two, the point is made in verse 15, that all the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, pride of life, not from the Father, but is from the world. Those three things. Those are those three avenues, if you will. Flesh, the desire of the eye life. You can throw any sin in one of those three categories. Either somebody has a sin because of their desire of the flesh and living for the flesh. The desire of the eye to the eyes or the pride they have in the devil's going to attack them. Which still, even in but the devil attacks in the same way. He did in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3. Six. I, I want you to think about Genesis chapter 3 and, and the temptation uh, to uh, eat. And beginning in verse 4, the serpent said, You will not surely die. For God knows good and evil. But 
the eye. Make one wise. Eight. Eight. So I want you to go back. Pride of life. The, the, the devil says for the as listen. Uh, instead, you'll be wise. So I, that's the pride of life. When she looked and saw the or she comes down late. And then she saw how it a delight in the eyes. There was the desire the of the eyes. And you go through those three different ways in verse chapter 2, and that's exactly how God tempted Eve here in, in Genesis chapter 3. We have the recording of the first ten. But not only did it do it with David, it did it with Christ. In Matthew chapter 4 and 1 through 11, there are Each of those using one of the of first chapter two. The desires of the eye, the desires of the flesh, the pride of life. That's why it can say in Hebrews four, we do not have a unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, for he was in every respect has been tempted as we, are, yet without sin. He was tempted as we are. Again, I uh, brought this up last week talking about prayer. I don't think he's talking about he's tempted with every single sin, but he's been tempted in every single avenue of temptation. The desires of the eyes, the desires of the flesh, the pride of life. He was tempted with each of those. And he returned in verse 18. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. So he, Christ uses the has been tempted, and we understand that suffering is not unique to us. Everybody faced it, and Christ faced it. That's why he's the perfect, sympathetic high priest. But not only can we be encouraged by the fact that we're not alone, and that we can find somebody who can sympathize with us, and ultimately Christ can, we can have encouragement in the fact that Christ can be trusted. You come later on in the text, you will not be tempted beyond your evil. God can be trusted. He's faithful. And in hope of eternal life, with God who never lies, you cannot lie. Promise before time began. So we know how, how is it that we know we have eternal life? Because God promised it and God cannot lie. The fact that God promised it and cannot lie means we can take confidence in what he said. He can be trusted. That means if God said he escape, and he did, that we can trust there's a way of escape. That means if God said that I can trust that I will not be tempted beyond what I can endure. And that means if God that we can trust that God will help us in temptation. He said all three of those. And we can trust they all are true. Because God can be trusted. He who, does not, who never lies, cannot lie. Promise before time began. Take encouragement that God can be trusted. Take encouragement in the fact that God will not allow you to be ability. In First Corinthians, a couple of passages, but you may want to stay here. No temptation is overtaken. Verse thirteen. It is not common. God is faithful. He will not on your ability. You've probably heard this before. Maybe you said this before. I just not help. Somebody engages in sin, and the reply instantly is, Yes, we can. Because God will not allow us to be tempted beyond our ability. In Luke 12, all numbered. Fear not. You're a mighty 
God will be with us. And God will make sure that we do not face anything beyond what we are. He watches over us. Each and every one of us. So we can accomplish that anything we can overcome. And God will take and attack us beyond what we can bear. In Job 12, Satan, uh, Satan talks about going to and fro on the earth. And God says, if you consider my servant Job, and Job basically says, you put a head, Satan basically says, you put a head, and you take a head, then he'll curse you. And God said, hold all you have in your hand, only against him, God stretched your hand. God put a restriction on Satan. And then Job comes in chapter 2, and the same thing again. And he's going, I said, you can sit and serve And Satan basically says, well, let me touch him. And even though I took everything from him, you didn't let me touch him, and that was not. And so in chapter 2, the Lord said, your hand. Only he placed restrictions on him again. The point is, that God would not face anything but our ability. As he told Satan in Job 2, Here's the restriction. God will not allow us to face anything we cannot overcome. And we can take encouragement. Faithful. And so what he told us is what we can believe. That God will not allow us to be taken beyond our ability. And finally, there is always, always, always a way to escape. A word here in one or verse uh, rendered escape. The word literally means an exit, a way out. It comes from the, uh, the the Greek word is ek basis, which is a compound word in the Greek. Ek means to be out of or from, by or away, and then basis meaning a stepping or a walking. The idea is there will always be a walking there'll always be a way out and so uh, that is presented to us so we can take that way of escape I, I, I've said I've used this illustration before. and it was on fire and we see smoke coming out I said if we stay in this building we're going to pray the first thing we want to do is look at these signs that are And find to get to safety. Well, in sin, there's always an accident. There's always when we're being tempted, there is a way temptation. So we always say it's not beyond our ability. Take the way of the game. So what we have to do is being tempted to sin, we need to look for the exit. Now, that may be the way out is different depending on the situation. Here's what I mean by that. Literally, going away from the temptation, running from it. By his garment, die with me. Hand. How did he He literally came out of the door. Maybe a temptation. And we find ourselves away from sin. And the best thing is to run. Somebody goes to a. And there may be everything. We're trying to figure out how to overcome Instead of sitting by the table and helping you with the best thing to do, get out of the door. It may take literally escaping from where the temptation is. And then sometimes that requires the knowledge of God's Word. In Matthew chapter 4, in Matthew 1 of the Jesus, and 
feast of Passover, as we already pointed out from 1 John 2 and in verse 16. Jesus replied, Each of the three, it is written. How did he overcome temptation? By relying on the knowledge of God's word. And so the way of escape may be different. That way of escape. We must. So we have to it and know that God will provide us a way of escape that we can overcome temptation. Encouragement to be offered about sin and temptation. First Corinthians chapter 10. Here's the warning. Don't let what happened to Israel happen to you. Here's a people that even God greatly blessed them to turn uh, to engage in sin. Not only do you not ignore God said sin, you need to not be confident because that eliminates watchfulness. And then we'll be here. Who says not me, but then is going to happen. We can have encouragement knowing that we're not except that this is common to man. Nobody, we're not alone to face what we're facing. We can have confidence that we can be trusted as faithful as the text says. We can have confidence in it. We can realize that we don't, that we've not beyond our ability to overcome. But instead, there is always a way to escape. That's the word. Say, I've been in. Just 